When God spoke, speaks to you, how do you know that that's God? How do you know it's not indigestion or like just like, I don't know, like just something that like my conscious, my subconscious is just like saying to me, like how do you know when you, you talk so confidently about God told you or God spoke something to you, like how does the rest of us hear from God? <laughs> See what I had to deal with when we were having our mentoring relationship? You think it was all cute and wonderful and Joy was taking notes and saying, wow. No, not so much. Mm -mm. I, don't okay. under, I don't get it. I want to know. Okay. I want to understand. Okay. Um, and the first thing that I want to say is I don't. There are and, you know, retrospect, they say 2020, you know. Well, that's safe. When I can say even, and I know the one place, because I always kind of think somebody's going to wonder how I heard that, uh, you know, right after George died and I'm sitting in the van and, you know, I was with my son-in-law and he goes, I don't know if I can, you know, follow anybody else in ministry. And I'm just thinking, what in the world am I doing? You know, and I did pray right then. And I did think that was what God said to me, but I wouldn't have said that at that time to you. I wouldn't have gone, wow, yesterday I got the word from the Lord, right? Does that make sense to you? It was like, I think that's the direction I'm supposed to go. I've got to go somewhere. You know, sometimes you just have to make a decision. I know that doesn't sound very spiritual, but I want to bring it off of that plane. Sometimes there are these things to decide before you, and sometimes you're just left with, I have to, because to not make a decision is to make a decision. And so just make that decision. Now later on down the road, when things have worked out well, and this looked like it was it, then I can stand up in front of you guys and I can say, the Lord spoke to me. <laughs> So just to be honest with you, at that time, if you had asked me that question, I would have said, I hope so, because I'm going to move on that one. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Does that cover it yeah. enough? I because that, and, and again, I don't think that's wrong. I think that's because we're, we're human, mm -hmm. and we want that to be. And the other thing is, I do fear God. And so in a good sense of the word, I don't want to put words in his mouth. Mm -hmm. And so when I can do it from this point of view where it's all happened and it's all been okay, then I feel fairly confident. But at the time, I, I, I really hesitate to say, I might say, I think maybe this is the leading I have. I think this is, you know. So for me personally, I've never heard an audible voice from the Lord. I've never had a dream that gave me direction. I have impressions that this is what I'm supposed to do. Sometimes my impressions haven't been right. I think I'm supposed to do this. And recently that happened to me. I thought, wow, this frees me to do that must be God. Something else totally different happened. Okay. So just to bring it down to that kind of. So I'm what glad do you keep? What's your, what's your keep? Like, is it reading the Bible? Like, how do you, what do you keep? To okay. Keep you. I mean, to be, uh, prayer. Okay. Bible reading. I look for that. I'm really, really hesitant. I'm, my background is in science. And, and I had all these, you know, so there's kind of a doubting thing that's going on there. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, um, I don't feel honest when I'm saying this is the way to do it or this is how it's going to look. But what I do know is, I mean, I have something, and it's from the word, right? Mm -hmm. it, he's promised to never leave me or forsake me. You know, he said that the, these super simple ones, and one of them I gave you today was just like, What's required in a, in a, in a servant? Mm -hmm. faithful. Faithfulness. Okay. And I think, okay, that's a tiny step right there. Mm -hmm. Because I believe in his faithfulness. And so whatever little bit of faithful, faithfulness is in me as his follower, I'm going to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and of course I have a fear of taking the wrong step or any of those things. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that really helps me is in Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about the children of Israel and how they, um, you know, they had all these things that God did for them. Their shoes didn't wear out. They had food. They had all of that. And the scripture right there, it says their sin was unbelief. That they didn't believe. And what was the unbelief? Because we all have unbelief, right? But their particular sin was they didn't believe that what God had done in the past, kept shoes on their feet, kept food on their tables and all mm -hmm. of that, that what God had done in the past, he wouldn't keep doing it. They questioned the faithfulness of God. And so... In my own life, personally, I try to watch out for that. Okay. What am I saying? I'm going into this new venture or doing this new thing. Let me see. What have you been doing, Lord? I believe that what you've been doing, you'll keep doing. Okay. You know, and help my unbelief. Is mm, that too good. rambly? Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. What would you say to some of my friends? They, they wrote in, like, just saying, like, what about those of us who've been disillusioned by God hasn't answered the prayers? We've asked him. We've read the Bible promises. Or what about even, like, 
Christian leaders who've taken the liberty of speaking for God and it doesn't happen like and there's people in this room even that are like how do we believe how do we not feel how do we trust you know how do we believe in the faithfulness of God when Christians who represent the name of God mislead us in that you know why did you have that one on there? That Sorry, question? I was just building up. <laughs> I was giving you the big one. I was trying to slowly build up into well, it. You were like, this, this is like hefty, the rat This the is the water. hefty one. <laughs> this is a big one. It is big, and it should be the, the theme of the next. Okay, that's our next conference. conference. <laughs> I'll make sure you come out to that one, too. <laughs> oh, I think you need variety. <laughs> okay, well, we'll just see. No, that is so hard. And it's complicated. So I want to say that up front. I don't have a pat answer for that one, okay. and I don't think pat answers work. I knew you wouldn't, so that's why yeah. I wanted you to answer that yeah. one. I knew you wouldn't give us a pat answer. But I do believe in the faithfulness of God. And I think that whatever, and I have family members who have been so dis disillusioned when they, and I have been, I mean, prayed that God would show up, and, that he, and why wouldn't he? Everything that I look at, I think, Lord, why wouldn't you? This is not just about her. This is, uh, your reputation is at stake. Mm -hmm. They're not going to believe in you anymore. And what a small thing. Just show up in the light, like a little light in the corner. That would be enough for her. Mm -hmm. I don't know why God doesn't do that. But he doesn't sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the way it is. About people, and I know that's also another huge one. When you have, it's not that you've put your trust in that person more than God. It's not that. Like talk of Christian leaders and so yeah. if you have, then you've got your answer. But if you haven't, but it's just been discouraging. And so, you know, well, we're all flesh, you know. Yeah. And we fail. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no excuse for it. But there is, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when it says... Love believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. You know, put some of those put some of those scriptures over some of the the problems, and not to quote them like they're the answer to everything, but really, how do we see the the person next to us? You know, what that leader did or what that person did are not right. You know, we can say there's no excuse for it, but um, but they're not God. They're not. That's not what God does. We all have, a, have our own will that we can do things. And so they've chosen by their will to do that thing and to judge all of the church or all of Christianity based on that. And, and we don't have to defend them, you know. People that we're sharing with or something like that, this is a little bit of a different type. But they go, the church, you know, they've disappointed me and they bring out some we don't have to say oh but like be the defender of the church we can just say right that was wrong that was just wrong hmm. but that's not who jesus is okay mm -hmm. and i think for our personal selves that's what i what, that's what we should say that's wrong but that's not who my god is yeah. that he permits it we have a free will and to be honest with you i don't have the answer to why he permits some of the things he permits i mean mm -hmm. i don't think i would do it that way yeah but I know that he's sovereign. I know I, I fall back on the things that I know he is, the things we learned in the first mm. looked at. He's sovereign. He's good. He knows more than I know. You know, and just letting those things go. And one more thing about having people disappoint you and, and legitimately do you wrong, so to speak, you know, um, the price of forgiveness is costly. And to say that all you need to do is what Jesus did from the cross. Father, forgive them. But you know, his forgiveness cost him his life. Do we think that our forgiving someone who's wrongfully treated us will cost less? So if you feel pain mm -hmm. when you have to for, when you, because you're a believer and Jesus said that, the one thing he pulled out of the Lord's Prayer, you know, about forgiveness. And when you think that's just, that's too hard that's mm. not fair that is it's not going to help them to, for me to they don't want my forgiveness mm. did the, that mass standing outside underneath the cross did they want his forgiveness you know but i think we need to be ready that that our forgiveness to them it's going to cost us it's a price forgiveness it's like just forgive them let them off the hook hurts yeah. right yes to forgive someone especially someone who doesn't really want your forgiveness yeah. doesn't care and then we should be someone who represents Jesus and know? someone who represents you and they're walking on and they're like, mm -hmm. please, you're hurting people. Yeah. Okay. But you're not forgiving them. 
doesn't have any effect on that. Mm. But it does have an effect on you. Mm. And so, but, but I think that expectation that is, it's not a pat answer because it hurts. Mm. Yeah. Forgiveness is costly. Think about what it cost him. Mm -hmm. I think like, it's just such, it's refreshing and I think we have to be reminded over and over again too about forgiveness. But I think in my own life, like we put people on pedestals we put people in different categories of like this person and this person. And so like I either idolize them or I hate them. Right. There's no middle ground. You know, I respect them to like a deep, like they're just the most honorable, loving, this, and then they hurt me and then I hate them and I just am bitter with them. So it's yeah. like such extreme. And I feel like I want to learn how to not put people in those categories. Oh, and I want to respect people, of course. I want to honor people and their, but... I wonder if our culture, we tend to do that in the wrong way. Yeah, I think that's true. As Christian leaders? I think it has to do with identity, Joy. Yeah. I think that we want to have cheerleaders yeah. for who we are. And those people that we respect and admire and are walking, they become our cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. And when they fall, something happens to our identity, totally. too. Because then we've got to go look for new cheerleaders. <laughs> exactly. Tell them, you guys are, I'm done with you. I always remember you telling me whenever I would feel on the spot, like, here I am, I'm the pastor's wife. I have to have all the answers. And I would run to Pam and be like, Pam, I don't know what to say. They're looking to me. They want to know. And she's like, every time God kicks that pedestal out from under you, you just be there. And I was like, I thought I was supposed to be on the pedestal. I thought that was my place, you know. And you were like, no, kick it out, kick it out. And that's the most freeing thing you could teach me, you know. I want to, but it's, it's so easy over time to let pedestals or let um, labels, whether it's hierarchy or this low place, to define who we are, you know. And we're neither. We're neither of those things. And there's a freedom in that. There's no, such a freedom. And you've taught me so that. True. You taught me that. Sometimes I think you say things that I taught you that I didn't. No, I, I can't. I can't make this up. I can't make this up, Pam. <laughs> well, so, Jesus did. Okay. Well, let me ask you another question. I want to ask, like, you talked this morning about the self-awareness and the self-focus. So, like, how do I keep? How do I keep that balance? Like, when I, I mean, I am definitely very self-focused. I would say I'm definitely on that side of the coin. The self. Okay. I'm more of the self-focus, like the over-self. And um, so how do we keep, like, what would be, like, just practically, just a practical thing, like, for our lives. We're women. We feel things. We're, things are, you know, they affect us. How do we keep that balance of being overly self-focused, extremely self-focused, and being, like, a healthy self-awareness? Like, I just, I want to have a self-awareness, like, like David. Like, I want to be able to ask the Lord to search me and know me. So what would be a practical way that you could encourage us to keep that balance? I think that one thing we can do, and that's a hard question, by the way. Sorry. I don't know. I mean, I fall into it all the time um, because here I am. Like I said, I read that uh, self-forgetfulness book every six months or so. That's very helpful. What was the other book that you, were, that you had titled? It was The Self. You had remembered the other title of the... Oh, what, what Hudson Taylor Hudson said. Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor said, oh, it was said of him that he was a man at leisure from self. At leisure. And I think about that. I mean, those are little things that are things that help bring me back to, you know, I want to be free from that. And when I find myself being bound, like that one period of my life when I just was so looking for somebody else to affirm me, you know, that was being self-focused. That was hmm. like somebody put something in to me that I, I don't feel in myself so I can feel better about myself, so, so that I'm okay, so that there's these people that, that really I have put as cheerleaders in a sense to me, so that... I'll be okay. And I think that things like that, you know, being at leisure from self, constantly looking at the danger being when I start focusing on myself, I know that my danger is I'm looking for someone from the outside to come in and help me besides Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he's already come on the inside to do that. You know, mm -hmm. he's the one who says that. And I feel like I'm not giving you anything practical. No, it's okay. But, but that's what I do. I mean, and, yeah. and it's a daily walk, and it's a daily thing that's being done. And also, you know, I think the Lord can also kind of convict us, and sometimes I just feel sick about mm. that. Like, I'm like, yuck, mm -hmm. that's me. You know, what's wrong with me? But another practical thing, and this isn't like the answer to everything, and it can also be something to build yourself up, but it's reaching out, right? It's mm -hmm. seeing someone else 
it's listening to someone not to hear how you're alike yeah. If you know what I mean, yes, it's like yeah. you, you start sharing your problems with me, and I start saying, "Oh, I can totally relate. I can actually trump you by five. Yeah, I got yeah. that. Totally. Wow. You see who taught I'm you? I'm tracking with you here. <laughs> I'm on your okay. I'm tracking. I get you. And so, but instead of doing that, think I'm going to listen. Yes, that's I'm going to hear, and it gives you that. I think it's a kind of what Jesus did. It's incarnational. It's like I hear you, and I don't. I've never been where you are. And admitting that, we've, we, somehow we have to always say, I know just what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And the other person often wants to say, you have no idea what exactly. I'm saying. So true. Do you care to know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's being open. And that, keep, I, you sort of, I sort of think about self-focus and, you know, as it's that, and I'm hurting. It's like the splinter, you know. And every, the more I focus on that splinter, the more it hurts. So I keep hitting it. And to get outside of that, and, mm. and see someone else and really listen, it takes the pressure off of That's so good. the thing that I'm, I keep rubbing or the tooth yeah. that keeps hurting That's that you so keep good. hot doing yeah. this thing to, you know. It takes the attention off. That's so good. Yeah. That's such a good, like, visual. That's so good. Um, someone wrote in. It was a really, really sweet question. Awesome. Um, she said, am I allowed to be lonely in my singleness even though I do believe God is with me? I hope so. Because I am. Okay. Yeah, there are those moments. And you know, the truth of the matter is we're very complicated. You yeah. know, we've got our emotions. We're complex. We've got huh? our, yeah. And I think that the Bible is the only book that actually speaks to the complexity of who we are. Mm. You know, we've got psychologists and they deal with a certain part. We've got Christian moralists who will deal with a certain yeah. thing. We have, and so there's all these things, but the Bible speaks to all of that. Mm. And the bottom line really is, and, and I think Proverbs says this, is that only the heart knows its own troubles. Hmm. And, you know, you can be smiling on the outside, I always forget how it's in the Proverbs, and hurting on the inside, yeah. and you think, yeah, that's probably a comedian or something, mm -hmm. you know, or those people. And we know, tragically, people yeah. that make us laugh often are the ones that, hurting. you know, yeah. are really, really hurting mm -hmm. inside. But anyway, so all that aside, it doesn't say that about particular people, Proverbs. It's all of us. Yeah. We all do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is kind of a cosmic loneliness, if mm -hmm. you will. I'm the only, per I mean, we open up to each other and we're meant for community and we need to do that. But I'm the only person who knows myself at that level. Mm -hmm. All right? Of course, Jesus knows that. But still, to know that sometimes I feel like I'm alone in the universe as far as people are concerned. And it's not, it's not wrong. It's just the way it is. That's, mm -hmm. that's us. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, there's times when I feel lonely and, and alone. And the bottom line is we are, except for him at hmm. times. So what about, like, people that are married? What about wives? Like, how do we, as a wife, still keep my own identity? Like, you identified yourself as a, a pastor's wife or a missionary wife. Like, how do you... How do we? How are we? Are still our own person, even if we're we're married and we have a, wa a hu husband, you know? So she's married, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, what I what I can see about that because I think that's a huge challenge. You yeah. want to be the best in in this particular. You want to be the best wife, the most supportive, the you know most days. Most days. And yeah. Yeah. And and you still got yourself to deal right. with and everything like that. I think that it comes down to. Um, what's your main love? Hmm. It comes down to, it, oftentimes in our lives, we have disordered loves. I thought my first love was supposed to be my husband. I'm a wife. Ah, there's your problem right oh, there. okay. Babe. So my first love is not supposed to be my husband? No. Okay. Oh. So here's the thing. Here's the, here's the test, okay? Okay. What is the one thing in my life that if everything fell apart, it wouldn't change. What is the one thing, and what are my, what's the one thing that I hope in, the one thing that I want the most, the one thing that I think if I have that, I'll be okay. And let's try some things out, okay? So I can say, you know, maybe you're, you're single, and the one thing that you think, you know what, I'm lonely, mm -hmm. and I, I want to do things, and I want to have someone with me, and if I just had that person to do those things with, my life would be great. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the one thing that would make everything right. Or let's say it is, you know, um, finances. 
you know, so it's hard to live hand to mouth, you mm -hmm. know, and here we are and every daggone month we have to figure out how we're going to make it and mm -hmm. if we're going to make it and we've got children, we want to do, th you know, if we just won the sweepstake. <laughs> and the lottery, I'm, the lottery. I'm sorry, the yeah. lottery mm -hmm. or whatever. I don't, yeah. you know, I don't want to make light of it, but it's like, Lord, if I don't want a lot. Jesus, yeah. I just want enough to live. If that were the case, my worries would be over. I, everything would be okay. Hmm. And just start putting things in that place that if I had that, everything would be, you know, and it fits in with what we've talked about too. But, and they're good things. I'm not talking about having idols in your life or anything like that. I'm talking about the genuinely good things, having a husband, having children, being financially secure, nothing wrong with that. All those things are, are good things. Mm -hmm. But again, just like we talked about identity, they're not ultimate things because all of those things will change. Mm -hmm. So maybe I find that person or maybe it's just if all my children would come to know Jesus, if they just walk with him, that's a great desire. But if that's at the center of your life, you're going to have problems. Mm -hmm. So I think it's taking those disordered loves and putting them where they should be. Mm -hmm. Just like you were saying, isn't my husband supposed to be first? No. Okay. You know, what is first? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Mm -hmm. And that's a practice, daily practice of doing mm -hmm. that. Because, and I heard somebody say this at one point, it's kind of graphic, but bear with me, is that he was saying, I love my wife so much. It was a pastor. And he said, for me, it's a constant thing to, that's not the center of my life. She's definitely everything to me. I mean, just so much. But someday, one of us is going to die. And let's say it's her. And she dies. And this is my life. This is the center of my, it's what keeps me going. It's, it was just my hopes and dream where I have this person that I totally love. Other things can go, but if I've got that, I'm okay. And now you're standing, I'm sorry if it's too graphic, but I've pictured myself here. But now you're standing over the casket. Mm -hmm. And there she lays, or he. There's no help coming from that one. It's mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. The center of your life is now gone. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If he's not the one, if, if he's not at the center, all the other things will change. All the other ultimately good things and then we should have those good things. We should have those things. But he needs to be. It's like we've got. For me, it's my children. Hmm. Right? When something goes wrong with one of my, and we've talked about this, yeah, with one of my, my children, question. then I feel it happening. Because mm -hmm. there's this phrase we say, you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. <laughs> yeah. So true. Yeah. And I can have my other kids that are all over the world sharing Jesus mm -hmm. and whatever, because I don't know what their problems are, so I can think that. Yeah. Um, and I prefer to think that. But I have one child, if I have one child that's having trouble, an adult child that's having trouble or going through things, there's, a le there's lead on my heart. Mm -hmm. And I can go forward and I can minister and I can do those things, but I'm just like, okay. And for me, it's, it's recentering. Let me ask you about that. Let me, like, so what about, like, so if our kids don't walk with Jesus, if we have kids that choose not to follow, isn't that a reflection of being a bad mom? Like, wasn't I, like, am I then a, a bad Christian mom if my kids don't love Jesus? Like, surely I didn't teach them in the ways that they should go so that when they're old, they will not depart. That's what that verse promises me. So I'm, like, holding to it, okay. you know? Well, let me talk about that promise first. Okay. It's not. Okay. Tell me. Tell me. The book of Proverbs is the way things should work in a, in a perfect world. Okay. It's the way that things are supposed to work. We're going to fall on creation, but this is how it should be. These are principles to follow. Okay. And so you've got that principle, but, but they're not promises. They never come off as, I promise you, the Lord says, but they say, train up a child in the way should, when they're old, they won't depart from it. This is the way it's supposed to work. It doesn't always work that way. Okay. And, and to see Proverbs where it's supposed to be with Ecclesiastes and with Psalms is a very good learning thing to do. So sometimes we take the scripture again, where you, it's, a book, it's, it's a book of morals, it's a book of rules, it's a book of promises, and it does have all those things in it, but that's not predominantly what it is. We are broken people living in a broken world and in a perfect world. Because read the book of Proverbs and it'll contradict itself in the sense that, it, you know, if you do all these things, you will be prosperous. 
And then it's got the other place where it goes. No matter what you do, evil men prosper. <laughs> okay, let me look at that verse. How does that work? So you see the book of Proverbs itself tells you that th this is the way it should be, but sometimes it isn't the way it is, mm -hmm. uh, if that makes any sense to anyone. So yeah. that was part of your question. Mm -hmm. Then is it on me that my children don't walk with the Lord? That's very complicated to ask that question because we're all imperfect. Mm -hmm. And did we do things that affected them, that have caused them to make decisions? Yeah, that sure, Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. were those times when I didn't do what I was supposed to do or yeah. what I should have done? I'm also broken, you mm -hmm. know. But ultimately, they have choices. Is it fair? You know, I don't want to go. It's not in the Bible, or it's, maybe it's Hezekiah. Life's not fair. Hmm. Something like that. Somewhere in there. But, yeah, probably. Yeah. But that's not a. That's not the right. That's not the right statement. It's not the right question. Tell me the one that you told me that the perfect father. The perfect. Father. Oh, okay. <laughs> I do remember something. <laughs> Sometimes I have to just remind her what she taught me. So then I want to let us all, you know, okay, you know, we're not perfect. But there was a perfect father, right? Who had children, right? Who were they? Adam and Eve. How did they turn out? Not perfect. I'm just saying. Yeah. I love that one. I love that one. Gets me every time. I love that one. Here's the thing that recently came to me, though, is if I can't, if I can't take the blame for what they do, I also can't take the credit, the credit oh. for what they're doing. <laughs> it just feeds my pride, you yeah. know? Hmm. But then, yeah. Then they're, but I can take the, that, that phrase, you're only as happy as your unhappiest child, what that motivates me to do more is to pray for them, to intercede for them. To, so it, I let it take me to what is the center of my life. Yeah. Because if you want to know what your fears are, take your fear and channel it to the center of your life, to mm. what makes you go. Mm. And you'll find out what, what makes you tick. And so for me, sometimes it's how my kids are doing. And I have this visual okay. that here's my, you know, here's my life mm -hmm. and there's the Lord on his throne. That's who I want to be the center of my life. And then one of my kids, and, and put whatever your fears are yeah. in there, whatever that might be, the death of your maid or any of those things. And, and take that fear and follow it to your heart. And what, what I find there is my love for my children pushing the throne of God off to the side. That's the thing that's happening, right? Mm -hmm. And that brings me back to center. And I go, wait a minute. I can, f I can be concerned. I can have fears. Let it encourage me into intercessory prayer for them. Mm -hmm. So good. That's a good thought to finish on, I think. I think I could spend all day with you, Pam, asking you questions. Thanks, Joy. Mm -hmm. We're going to um, finish up. And I want to keep asking these questions. I, wanna, I don't want to be afraid to ask questions. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. So when we stop asking questions, that we build up this weird culture within Christianity that I don't think ever was intended to be there, but we just assume. I thought that's what Christian ladies look like. I thought that's what Christian families are supposed to be. I thought that's how it's supposed to be. And, and I think the more we start to ask the questions, we start to be able to see clearly you know, and not all questions can be answered perfectly. And sometimes it doesn't matter. It's not even that I need a, a perfect answer. It just kind of helps to break the, the, the bond that goes over our thoughts and our thinking sometimes, whether it's your view of God, whether it's your view of the church, whether it's your view of family, whatever it is that we have this, we can have these false views of. And it just ha it's, it's human nature. It happens to all of us. Over time, things just become molded and shaped. But that's why the word of God is what keeps us moldable and, and keeps us pliable, that we don't get stuck. And I don't want to get stuck. As a woman, as a human, in my identity, I want to constantly be growing and learning and changing. So I pray that for each of us, that we would all have teachable hearts to learn and to receive afresh, no matter how old you are. Something I've learned about Pam is she's never stopped learning. And that's a huge thing to see a woman who's raised children, lived a full life, you know, but she's still learning. And I want to be that way. I never want to stop learning, ever. 
because that's when we continue to grow.